Hi, it's Greg Dalton. I'd like to hear your comments on the show, topics we should cover, and guest suggestions. You can reach me at greg at climateone.org. This is Climate One. I'm Greg Dalton. The negative impacts of burning fossil fuels reached the highest levels of the U.S. government earlier than most people realize. The first president to be briefed about climate change was LBJ in 1965. Every president since then has been briefed about the issue. But for nearly six decades, the federal government passed no comprehensive climate legislation. Now that's changing. The Inflation Reduction Act contains approximately $370 billion of investments in clean energy and climate solutions. And with the new bill moving toward the president's desk, the United States has concrete evidence to show the rest of the world that we are indeed taking the climate crisis seriously. It allows the United States to say we are at the table. The Inflation Reduction Act. What's in the sausage? Up next on Climate One. Since LBJ was first briefed on climate disruption in 1965, a handful of U.S. senators have blocked attempts to address it holistically. In 1994, Senator Robert Byrd, Democrat from West Virginia, opposed President Clinton's plans for a national tax on energy based on output or BTUs. A few years later, Byrd and Chuck Hagel, Republican from Oklahoma, basically killed U.S. ratification of the Kyoto Protocol. In 2009, President Obama and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi got a comprehensive climate and energy bill through the House, only to see it die in the Senate. A few years later, the Paris Climate Agreement was structured as a voluntary deal, not a treaty, so it would not have to be ratified by the U.S. Senate. That streak seemed to be continuing when last month Senator Joe Manchin announced he was no longer negotiating on a slimmed-down version of President Biden's Build Back Better agenda. Two weeks later, Senator Manchin and Majority Leader Chuck Schumer shocked everyone when they announced a surprise deal on energy, taxes, and health care. Now, for the first time in history, the U.S. Senate has passed significant climate legislation. For those of us who've been following the growing climate crisis for years, the last month has been an especially wild, emotional, intense roller coaster ride. Chelsea Henderson is director of editorial content at Republic EN and a former staffer on the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee. She worked for John Warner, Republican senator from Virginia, when he attempted to enact climate legislation. Sam Ricketts is co-founder of Evergreen Action and former advisor to Jay Inslee's presidential campaign. Benishi Albert is co-executive director of the Climate Justice Alliance and previously the Movement Building Coordinator with the Indigenous Environmental Network. To get through the Senate, the bill offered a lot of carrots to the fossil fuel and renewable power industries. I asked Sam Ricketts how that all balances out. The Inflation Reduction Act contains approximately $370 billion of investments in clean energy and climate solutions uh, in the electricity sector and in sustainable agriculture and forestry, in advanced and clean manufacturing and industrial decarbonization, in clean and more efficient buildings and building appliances uh, and otherwise, uh, and electric vehicles and transportation decarbonization. Uh, those investments would help achieve, based on modeling for a number of analyses, an approximate 40% reduction in greenhouse gas pollution below 2005 levels by 2030, uh, which begins the path towards President Biden's goal of cutting carbon and greenhouse gas pollution in half across the country, across the economy, under 2005 levels by 2030. His commitment is a 50% reduction. This this um, this bill would help achieve a 40% reduction um, most of the way there. That said, the bill um, is a compromise, a a result of a long, painstaking and difficult negotiation between Senator Schumer, Senator Manchin and others involved in the Congress. And as such, uh, it contains bad provisions, provisions that are going to harm communities, provisions that will contribute more pollution, more greenhouse gas pollution. Certainly the analyses we've seen from some of the modelers show uh, the climate pollution reductions associated with the 
climate pollution additions from fossil fuel pieces of the bill being outweighing them by, you know, by about 24 to 1. So significant reductions in climate pollution. But really importantly, these provisions offered, included in the bill by Senator Manchin, are, are not just bad because of their climate pollution. They're bad because of the direct pollution that it will impact communities. They're bad because of the fossil fuel extraction that has been ongoing in harming these communities, particularly in the, in the provisions we're talking about. We're going to be dealing with particularly in the Gulf South uh, and in the Arctic and Alaska, but but other parts of the country as well. And, and these provisions will, you know, will continue harms and not alleviate environmental injustices and environmental racism, racism that has been ongoing for decades. And so we need to hold both of those truths uh, at this at this time, that this is a historic bill with transformative inve investments that are going to drive down climate pollution, that are going to get a chance to put real economic opportunity and pollution reductions into communities, create good jobs, and begin to address the climate crisis at the scale that's necessary. But it also, that there's going to be the continuation of extraction and pollution um, and the work of uh, fossil fuel industries that will continue to harm communities. And those things both need to be held at, at this important moment. Benishi, what good, bad, and ugly do you see in the energy and climate provisions of this big bill? The way the way that our um, political system works is communities elect leaders to like make these decisions, um, but also with the intention is that there's a direct relationship to those communities. But I say intention because the practice is not always the same, right? And so, you know, you have a bill like this that has a lot of what could reduce greenhouse gases and what's there, but is also devoid of like real relationship to the communities who are being directly impacted. We call those frontline communities and frontline being those who are dealing with the harms of the climate crisis and have been dealing with them for decades, right? Those in, the, in Alaska and the Gulf South, folks who are dealing with extreme drought, wildfires, like these are accumulation of like impacts of climate change and communities have been dealing with them for a long time. Additionally, those communities who live along the fence line of, you know, polluting industries, we also call frontline communities. Those frontline communities in our political process often don't get consulted. There's few, there's pockets that happen every now and then, but by and far, what is there is is devoid of like real community input of like here's how this can be helpful for us so i'll say i'll say that first you know in in terms of the harms right even though like there's plenty of stuff there that climate justice environmental justice communities have long fought for there's also a lot of stuff that just you know makes it easier for uh, further expansion of oil and gas development that ties some renewable energy development to oil and gas expansion. And then there's other things in there that, you know, uh, you know, are technologies that are about reducing greenhouse gases. But a lot of times we call some of those solutions false solutions. And we have real criticism about some of those. Nuclear is in there as a clean carbon-free energy source. But nuclear is not clean. It's not clean from its whole life cycle, from mining to production to, you know, how it uses the energy to the storage of its waste. Like the lifetime of nuclear um, and, and its harms to community, you know, far spans our generation. You know, some of those spent fuel rods are going to remain toxic for hundreds of years beyond beyond this moment, beyond this generation. So to tout that that's a clean energy source and to prop that up, you know, it's, it's greatly concerning to us. So it's not transformative. It perpetuates a lot of the power dynamics and things that define our political system. Chelsea, much of the serious debate around climate policy centers on the tools. Should we use government regulation, tax incentive, you know, markets, risk disclosure, kind of carrots and sticks? What does this bill rely on? Well, obviously, this bill makes a historic investment with that $370 billion. And, you know, at Republican.org, we would prefer to see a price on carbon as an approach. I'm not going to say no to $370 billion invested to make progress on climate change. I personally have been working on this issue for about 20 years, and I think collectively between me and Sam and Benishi, maybe we reach 50 years together of having worked on this issue. And so I have to look at symbolically what it means that 
we are finally seeing having something that we'll be able to celebrate. But at the same time, as um, our executive director, Bob Inglis, would say, the work is not done. And obviously, there isn't a huge appetite um, for a carbon tax, which is, you know, a tool that I would put a price on carbon to sort of set some of those market signals. But I really think that we do need to come together and talk about having real codified targets, timetables, price on carbon, just to, it's great that that the estimate is 40% reduction by 2030. But we all have been around this block a number of times, and I would hate to see that not achieved because it's a perceived goal, but not a directly stated goal. Benishi, the House passed a clean electricity performance plan that incentivized power utilities to move to cleaner electricity and penalize those that didn't. Some utilities that oppose that are lining up behind this new version, including Arizona Public Service and American Electric Power, which delivers power in 11 states. What do you make of that shift that the industry kind of is getting on board behind this? Is that a good sign or does it make you suspicious? <laughs> Uh, I have may have been at this too long. And so uh, those kind of things make me raise an eyebrow <laughs> for sure. Yeah. You know, I one, you know, what is considered clean power is one. So that term clean is a tricky term. And so, yeah, you know, the, the clean energy production the credit that is there, you know, is good. It sounds good on the front end. You know, when you read it, you're like, hey, yeah, that's great. We want clean energy. But at the same time, you know, some of those technologies that are being used to produce clean energy pollute in other ways, right? And like Chelsea, you know, I think there's other approaches that we also need to be um, taking. For me, when I think about, you know, the list of technologies and tools that are being put out there and that I, you know, consider false solutions, part of that is because all of those have to do with reducing carbon once it's produced. A bill like this is not doing much to say, stop producing carbon. It's not, we're, as a country, we're not even remotely close to saying, stop producing carbon. This bill, along with others, along with lots of other legislation, always come from a place of like, all right, let's figure out how to clean it out of the air once we once we can. But right now where we're at, like, you know, from the communities who are experiencing this, you know, the crisis that we're in is we could be cleaning for decades and not get caught up. Right. And so for us to not address the production side and saying we need to tighten up regulations on stop producing so much carbon um, or, you know, reducing that, we will still be implementing these techno fixes in a way that are not real solutions, but half gap measures that allow the industry to continue to pollute the way it is. This bill is is latent with that. You know, it's laced with that all through the bill. I was just going to say that in my free time, which I have so much in abundance of, um, I'm writing a book on the history of politics of climate change, sort of looking back mid 70s to the present day. But in conducting the research for this book, I was astonished to learn that the first president to be briefed about climate change was LBJ in 1965. Every president since then has been briefed about the issue. We burn fossil fuels, we create carbon dioxide, we're warming the planet. And in that 1965 memo to um, LBJ, they said by the year 2000, if we don't slow down our fossil fuel emissions, we're going to have sea level rise, more intense storms, droughts, heat waves, all the things that 20 years after that we're experiencing in droves now. And it's been really interesting to sort of look at the history, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican in the White House, you're incentivizing fossil fuels and sometimes also incentivizing clean energy or renewable energy. But to what Benicia was saying, the, the emphasis is been more on what we do after we make it and not on stopping at the source in the beginning. And that does seem to be a missing part of, of the equation. You're listening to a conversation about the Inflation Reduction Act, an energy tax and health care bill. Coming up, despite the progress being made, 
vulnerable communities continue to bear the brunt of the harm from mining and energy production. I am 100% behind wind and solar and other renewable sources, but also like how do we share the responsibility so it's not the same communities over and over being, you know, sacrificed. That's up next when Climate One continues. Kirsten Sinema was the last Democratic senator to support the climate and tax bill. In order to get her vote, the Democratic leadership dropped a provision that would have closed the carried interest tax loophole, which mostly benefits wealthy hedge fund and private equity managers. I asked Sam Ricketts how big a compromise that was. Well, look, the bottom line is she's on board now. There have been back and forth on the pay-fors, the revenue provisions, the climate provisions and otherwise in this bill for 18 months. It has been a long slog, a number of pieces, both inside of the climate space and outside on the revenue revenue thing, have been toggled over, have been um, uh, offered up and then backtracked on. We're there now. The bottom line is we're there. They've got the set of pay-fors. They've got the investments. They've got the good and the bad when it comes to the climate provisions. They've got other pieces in the bill like an important provision to help Americans save money on their prescription drug costs. And this will be a major moment and a starting point to the point that's the word of the conversation we're having here. This doesn't solve any one problem. This doesn't solve the climate challenge. This is the be- beginning of with, with major investments into communities that, are, that is going to need to be bird dogged and, and paid attention to. And, and the implementation is going to be everything. But this is, in other words, somewhat like a starting gun for a race that's going to be d- hopefully define the coming decade of building something better building a more just, a more inclusive, a more sustainable clean energy economy that actually bends down carbon pollution and toxic pollution in communities, that that turns the tide on formerly a 20th century fossil fuel powered economy to a clean renewable powered economy for the future that can have less pollution, less premature death, less kids growing up with asthma, more good union jobs, right? More economic opportunity. That's That's the future in front of us um, uh, that this bill doesn't entirely deliver. This bill is a part of the path towards. And and to be clear, there's going to need to be other tools. We're talking here about some of the other things that were either left out of the bill um, or, not, or, or need still yet to be done, right? There's the president and the executive and the federal government needing to use bold executive action to get after the sources of pollution through the Clean Air Act and otherwise, um, that's going to need to be continued leadership from states. States, local governments, and communities have been basically road testing a number of the policies that are being brought forward here by Congress, but they can't slow down. That's not a sideshow. That's a central part of what needs to continue to happen too. States continue to take a leadership on you know, zero emission buildings, on, on getting pollution out of transportation and, and the power sector and the like. So lots still yet to be done. This bill is a major inflection point, though, and provides an opportunity with these investments to grease the skids for this all going faster and and in the right direction. Uh, Chelsea, uh, Senator Manchin had said Republicans would vote for this in normal times. It pays down the debt. It increases permitting of energy projects, increases energy production, those things that Republicans typically seek. Uh, and yet Americans for Prosperity, part of the Koch political network, ran ads on social media urging Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema to oppose this bill. So what do you make of it? Would this be something that Republicans in normal times would support? Well, I think um, the problem is that it was done through this budget reconciliation process. So a partisan process, to, even though it includes things that might be attractive to other Republican lawmakers, is always going to have that little, you know, you're pitting um, the parties against each other. And we definitely would prefer to see this be bipartisan If you want durability in what you're trying to do, there has to be bipartisanship. But then the truth of the matter is there aren't 10 extra votes for to do this outside the budget reconciliation process. So there's no 60 votes right now for one thing on climate change in the Senate. So I wish that this could come about differently, but I understand that this is the mechanism, that these were the tools that um, were available to get the bill done. Right. So when you say durability, does that mean that the Republicans are going to spend the next few years attacking and trying to undo this thing like they did Obamacare? One can only imagine. (laughs) Um, And, you know, it's always it's always tricky. I mean, at least with this, the difference between a bill like this and, say, like the Clean Power Plan is that 
this is real money. It's going to be spent out and nobody can take those dollars back. Whereas a pre a subsequent presidency could always roll back a regulation. So, you know, in that sense, there is, I guess, a little bit of durability baked in. One thing that I worry about is, and Benishi was saying this, the climate impacts are baked in now, right? So even if we stop emitting CO2 today, the whole world, we're still going to see these impacts of warming, right? Because it takes years, decades, even longer for the cycle to catch up. And so I am a little bit afraid that people who aren't paying as close attention will look at this and say, oh, we just did solve climate change. We put all this money into it. And when they're still seeing hurricanes, floods, forest fi- wildfires, droughts, then there's going to be sort of a cynical response. What did we spend all that money on when all of us here know that it's a little more nuanced than that? You, we, we need more of the sustained effort over time, over time, over time. And then maybe my grandkids will start to see a climate that is a little more stable. Yeah, the scale of that. That's a good point. I hadn't thought of that. That like, hey, we, we spent that money. Didn't we fix it? But you see, you know, President Obama famously focused on health care and never got a climate bill through the Senate. This bill combines health care, taxes, climate and energy. What do you make of the packaging of the issues and the way it's being presented to the public? President Biden, you know, ran on a campaign that included like this is going to be one of his main priorities that leaves communities like optimistic and still slightly skeptical. And so for me, like no matter what happens with this Inflation Reduction Act, I still think President Biden needs to declare a climate emergency. I think that needs to happen, right? Because one, it sets agencies in a different pathway to say, we need to look at this in a different way. It sets industry in a different pathway that we need to address things in a different way. And it says to communities, hey, I am taking serious the concerns, the impacts and the harms that are happening. And I want to make sure something happens quickly. But also what it does for world leadership is to say, hey, this is the pace. This is the urgency that we need to be moving with. And right now, I'm, I'm trying my best to remain hopeful that President Biden will do that. Because in all honesty, like in hearing him talking to the campaign, I thought that would be something that would have been right out the gate. And instead, you know, I think he is tied like many other presidents before, President Obama included. We live in a country whose history, whose history is wound up and wrapped up into oil and gas development. Our economy is so intertwined with oil and gas development. I live in Oklahoma. I'm from Oklahoma. I am in the belly of the beast in oil, in oil and gas country, right? We have sports teams who, who are called oilers and drillers. Like this is how ingrained this is in our culture, which does then mean that our political, like even our political system helps facilitate that and maintain that. And for the communities here in Oklahoma who are dealing with harms of living along oil refineries who are like spewing out, you know, uh, different burnoffs at night and they're like seeing that in on their vehicles and then their grass, you know, communities in Texas who can light their lawns, communities in Alaska who are losing land, whole villages slipping into the sea because of sea level rise, right? hurricanes in the Gulf South. Like people are dealing with this stuff in a long time and they are very clear how they want to see like aggressive, urgent action happen because they're dealing with harms and loss of life today, not in the future. And I think, you know, I feel like the the response that we're getting is, is you know, like that proverb of like putting a frog in a pot and then setting it to boil, right? Climate change, people's responses have been that way because it isn't an abrupt thing, but a gradual thing. People have come to accept, oh, well, the new normal is that we have more increased, you know, intense tornadoes or wildfires or drought and and across the world. Like that has now become like, all right, well, that happened. There's going to be wildfires in California every year and people accept that. It's amazing how quickly humans can kind of like shrug and, you know, yeah, sort of accept fires and all those sorts of things. Sam, there are about 
$9 billion in consumer home energy rebate programs in this sprawling bill focused on low-income consumers to electrify home appliances and for energy-efficient uh, upgrades. Take us a walk around a typical American home. What does this bill mean for the car in the garage, the equipment that heats water in rooms, what's in the kitchen, on the roof? Indeed. So there are there are these provisions uh uh, and rebates provided through the bill, as well as expanded tax incentives for the bill for home energy efficiency and electrification. It, a lot of people, they, they, their energy costs every day come through powering, turning on the lights and paying for electricity, and also driving their car and paying for gasoline. Those things are massive costs, but also heating and cooling their homes, uh, both the water and the air inside their living spaces, which of course uh, in places where it gets really hot or really cold, we, we need to survive. Uh, and those appliances oftentimes are run on gas, on fossil gas. And that gas has its carbon impact. It also gives off um, uh, conventional air pollution like nitrogen oxides that harm and, and, and volatile organic compounds that harm public health, that harm human beings' health. We're thinking here of gas stoves, but gas water heaters, gas furnaces. Um, there's been, you know, it's long been known this is a contribution to the climate crisis. Uh, buildings are responsible, commercial and residential buildings are responsible for about between 10 and 15 percent of uh, U.S. greenhouse gas pollution. But also, this is a public health crisis. More and more uh, research has been coming out showing that burning these gas appliances inside of people's homes is contributing to asthma, contributing to health problems. And these new federal incentives will, and, 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 and both the rebates and the tax incentives will allow people to go out there to get more efficient, more cost effective, more affordable, and less polluting appliances to put in their homes. Again, health impacts, cost impacts and climate impacts all at one, well, even while building these 10 new technologies that the U.S. wants to lead in, both for economic growth here domestically and to lead the world. So you know, this is a version that you, you talked about, you know, one particular piece, $9 billion in these rebates for uh, energy efficiency and electrification of homes. This is but one of the provisions that that is part of this massive $370 billion investment in a range of different sectors that's going to drive down energy costs, that's going to drive down pollution, that's going to create more jobs and ec economic opportunity in, in communities. One of the critiques of previous uh, efforts in this realm is that they they favor uh, coastal elites who can drive Teslas. You know, it, it sort of favors uh, people who are on the upper income scales. There are some income caps here in this bill uh, and th that it tries to kind of push the benefits down the income ladder. Benicia, your thoughts? Should, should income be a consideration or do we just need to get as many clean vehicles on the road as possible? Transportation is the biggest sector of greenhouse gas emissions. I'm not going to bash electric vehicles, like, absolutely. But at the same time, the communities um, that are part of the Climate Justice Alliance, the, the member organizations, they're communities who do not have the access anyway. Like, they just don't have the income access to say, oh, we're going to buy a vehicle. Like, they're, they're depending on, you know, public transportation and, 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 and those other sources. So, like, what are we looking in that overall as well? And then, you know, there's also lots of other practices besides the vehicles. I mean, there's plenty of cities who, you know, buses are left idling and sitting in places waiting to, like, roll out. The same with, you know, um, semi-trucks and... And, you know, airplanes, like there's all these other measures that we also could be adding to this besides saying like, oh, let's let invest all our money in electric vehicles and making sure people like move to that. I, you know, I applaud it. Sure. Great. And it's not the like, it's not the thing that's going to be more most relevant to the communities that, you know, we're we're trying to make sure um, voices who are being heard about this and. And, you know, the flip side, even, even if the electric vehicles and in renewable energy sources, too, is, you know, like we have to look at like how people are sharing the responsibility for all of this. And I say that because storage of energy for wind and solar, like storage is a concern, right? Because those minerals that are used for batteries and for the solar panels and different, those come from places. They come from actual places where people live. <laughs> um, and so, you know, and, and it's not to say let's not do that. Like I 100 percent behind wind and solar and other renewable sources, but also like how do we share the responsibility so it's not the same communities over and over being, you know, sacrificed or that we're being going to and saying, well, sorry, like you're in a rural community. So there's fewer of you than there are in Chicago or in wherever, you know, like um, 
you know, that we all have to like share that responsibility or at least at the very least be conscious that it it comes from somewhere. It impacts real people. Like when we say, oh, we're going to, you know, pull hydrogen and do it this way and they're, they're, you know, there's some harm that can happen, but it's only happening to a few people. Like you should know who those people are. Mm, yeah, we, we did a whole episode on on mining and how the the green economy does, shouldn't just uh, kind of replace a different kind of extraction of a different thing in a different place. Sam Ricketts, you wanted to get in there. You know, the Inflation Reduction Act does include $3 billion in block grants to disadvantaged communities. You know, is President Biden delivering on his promise of, you know, centering his efforts on climate justice and inclusion? There's a, a host of investments in the bill that are really targeted towards environmental justice and disadvantaged communities. Uh, there's also harms in the bill, like we've talked about, but it's really important to put investment in the communities, particularly communities that have long been disinvested in, that have been suffering legacies of pollution that are now suffering the brunt of climate impacts, certainly being hit first and worst. But the program like this, the Environmental and Climate Justice Block Grants, is an opportunity to create new sustainability plans, to build clean energy projects in communities. And it's really going to start with building capacity in those communities to even be able to receive and execute on plans and projects. And that's what a, a, pr a program like the Environmental and Climate Justice Block Grants at the, at the EPA that would be created by this bill can do. It can borrow from the successes of some pro from programs throughout the country, like California's Transformative Climate Communities Program, that is really a program about building community capacity that that could be a force multiplier that could allow that community not just to take advantage of that $3 billion, but to then to have capacity they're building themselves to take advantage of all the other things, the tax credits that we just talked about, the rebate programs that we just talked about, building capacity in communities so that they can execute on their own plans for their future and, and take advantage of the other federal investments and private and public sector investments that are going to flow and be catalyzed through this bill. Yeah, I yeah. just wanted to add, you know, like that money around the those block grants is like it is a big deal for this to be in there and to move that but yet again like this is a place where this could be better and stronger if it was just a, a different approach because in in the bill right now there's direct investment there's direct expenditures to oil and gas but to communities of color around environmental justice there's a block grant right it's a competitive process like Let's let's apply and let's see who has the most harmed community that needs help or who has the most like dynamic program versus saying, hey, we're just going to like have this happen. And that amount of money should be twice that. Right. Because we need we need thousands of community based projects happening that are led by community are saying this is how we want energy to be produced for our community this is how we'll be accountable to it this is how we want to manage it and there needs to be thousands of those across the country so one make that more money to make it easier for folks to get to and do the direct investment the same way that there's that bill lays out lots of investment to infrastructure around oil and gas like let's say we're doing direct investment into communities not just through like these competitive grants where you know it becomes like the hunger games you know i'm reflecting on community block grants from the 90s and what a mess that had been like and i'm hoping like oh my god let's not let that be but and so i'm saying I support that being there, but man, this was an opportunity to make that much, so much stronger and so much easier for communities to access. Interesting point. Chelsea, there's a side deal that fast tracks the Mountain Valley pipeline in West Virginia and limits avenues for legal challenges. It also changes permitting of fossil fuels and renewable energy projects. What's your view on the impact of this change in permitting, the side deal? I mean, I hear that my cynical brain just automatically says that's how the sausage gets made in Washington, D.C. You had one very powerful man whose vote was needed. And yeah, he was going to get what he wanted out of that. So Sam might be able to speak more specifically about the impacts. But I look at that and having negotiated bills on the Hill as a Senate staffer and um, later as a lobbyist, like there's always a price. Sure. Sam, your thought on the side deal uh, for the Mountain Valley Pipeline in West Virginia that was part of getting Joe Manchin on board. And it has some broad, potentially broad implications for both fossil and clean projects. Certainly. Well, there is a there is a side deal. And I want to be clear, it's not part of this legislation. So it's going to have to go through a separate process. It's going to have to obtain 60 votes in the Senate, not 50, as this process allows for. And it's going to play out over, you know, assuming over the course of the 
coming weeks and months. I, people have talked about it being the part of the discussions around the end of year uh, spending bill that has to get passed by September 30th to avoid a government shutdown or maybe the end of year defense authorization bill that always gets done in the fall. Like this is this is a process that's going to play out. And we look for and we look forward to having that debate when it, if and when it does. So we'll be ready for that. Um, we should not be gutting America's fundamental foundational environmental bedrock bedrock laws for one, and we shouldn't be advancing new fossil fuel infrastructure for two. And certainly not cutting out communities um, uh, out of the environmental review process that these laws allow. And so, you know, I know there's, this has been, to Chelsea's point, part of how the sausage gets made, part of what Schumer and Manchin have talked through and, and talked around, but it's still got to be a legislative process that plays itself out. Benishi, the Biden administration recently proposed giving states and tribes more say under the Clean Water Act rules on water discharged into waterways. Environmentalists supported that. Industry expressed some concerns. Now this seems to be going in a different direction. So your take on this permitting side, this, as Sam just told us, isn't done, but it is a adjunct to this bill. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you get into the if you get into the meat of what is in that side deal, it's about like. Um, fast tracking and limiting community participation. It specifically names uh, limitations on state and tribal governments like giving input. It, it, and so it, it it's requiring the states to like do these extra steps, but at the same time saying we're going to like fast track that we're going to limit the amount like, you know, matters can be in court. Like these are all provisions these are all provisions that have to do about community participation, community oversight and regulation. And to, and to say like, um, you know, this side deal um, will benefit the community when, it, when at the same time it's saying we're going to limit how you participate. I think, it, I, I think it is clear who the intention is um, around who this, this side agreement benefits. Well, but couldn't it also, there's lots of uh, energy trans, uh, renewable energy transmission lines. There's lots of clean projects that also get held up by, uh, by environmental review. This is not just about oil and gas. This could be a lot, about a lot of wind and solar that gets held up because, you know, the National Environmental Policy Act has been weaponized. Is that fair also? You know, one of the languages that I found interesting in reading, you know, some of what was in the side deal was you know, how to like prioritize projects um, for, you know, national priority around energy, right? And one, and, and so there was a list of criteria to, to encourage as part of this side deal, which was reducing consumer energy costs. Absolutely support that. Improve energy reliability, decarbonization potential, and promoting energy trade with our allies, right? Outside of the energy costs, reducing energy costs for customers, there's nothing in there about community. There's nothing in there about protecting, you know, protecting jobs for the community, protecting the health and well-being of community. There's nothing in there in, in you know, saying here's how we should prioritize projects that have to do like, is this really going to benefit a community? It's really about like, you know, the trade and commerce of the industry, and so, yeah, while I hear that and I hear like, yeah, there are projects, but the projects that are around renewable energy that are happening there, they, they're not the ones who wrote this agreement, right? Those aren't the industries that wrote like, here's how, here's how we want to make sure. Because for me, I absolutely support, there's so many like small community projects who are doing um, solar installations rurally and in urban areas. You know, and and how are they like accessing that? How are they having access and ease and access to grid to the grid to like have that energy be in the grid and and have that benefit them as a community? I want to see that happen. Absolutely, this side deal is not about that. This side deal is about making the ease and 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 making it more profitable for the industry. As we wrap up here at the end, I'd like to ask you how to describe this bill in one sentence or phrase. I know there's it's complex, it's big, it's it's still uh, people are still digesting it, but Chelsea, what's one phrase or sentence to describe how you feel about this tax climate and health bill? I would say that it is both historic and imperfect. So for all the reasons that Benishi has laid out about community um, imperfection for sure, but it is a significant amount of money and it is 
a victory to some extent on climate change. We cannot rest on our laurels. We have to keep fighting. Benishi, one phrase that describes where you are on this. Um, with this bill, you know, it, it, you know, it makes me think about the political process being both cake and hard pills to swallow. Um, okay. This one is also fraught with some poison pills. Sam, one phrase that describes where you come down on this bill. I was actually, um, Chelsea took two of my words. I was going to say historic and imperfect, but I'll add one more, which is transformative, because there is the, there, there is the opportunity inherent in these investments to begin to build something better. And I think that's what we're about here. And that's what we've got to turn to next. Chelsea Henderson, Sam Ricketts, Benishi Albert, thank you for coming in on Climate One today to talk about this big moment in climate. Thank you. Thank you. You're listening to a conversation about the big new bill on climate, taxes, and health care that recently passed through the U.S. Senate. Coming up, how will this new domestic legislation play on the world stage? This is the necessary next step to say, you see, we've now invested, we've now agreed to invest a lot of money, $370 billion, towards that goal. That's up next when Climate One continues. Sumini Sengupta is international climate reporter for the New York Times and anchor of the Climate Forward newsletter. I asked her what effect the new climate legislation could have internationally. It's a big deal. It will help Americans primarily, but it does have some uh, ramifications internationally. First, what does it do? Well, the $370 billion in the law uh, mainly through incentives and tax credits, you know, it pours a lot of money into decarbonizing the economy, essentially to spur the development of lots of renewable energy technology um, and other efforts to, to decarbonize. That helps to bring down the costs globally. Right. The Biden administration came into office with a message to the world of America's back. They haven't quite delivered on that yet. Is that credible now? It does help the United States address its responsibility to the rest of the world, its historic responsibility to the rest of the world, because the United States is the largest emitter by far in the industrial era. So the Biden administration, remember, said uh, it would reduce by roughly half its emissions by 2030, essentially during this decade. That's a pretty ambitious target, not the most ambitious in the world, but it's an ambitious target. This uh, investment, this would go quite a ways, according to independent analyses um, that we've seen. And if combined with state and local efforts, the United States could, in principle, meet that 2030 target. Now, what does the bill not do? That's really important to keep in mind. It doesn't do anything to help other countries pay for new renewable energy projects, nor help other countries adapt to the effects of climate change, because this is not about money for international climate finance. That's a big deal because the U.S. remains uh, a laggard in international climate finance. President Biden pledged that the U.S. would give $11.4 billion a year by 2024. So far, what we've seen is Congress approving just a mere fraction of that. Congress has approved about $1 billion of that pledge. To be fair, the United States still has some years because we're not at 2024 yet. But that's going to be watched very closely, particularly by countries in the global south. That lack of international climate finance, which is not part of this bill, is going to be pointed out, no doubt, at the next international climate negotiations, which, as many of your listeners know, is called COP 27. COP stands for the Conference of Parties to the International Climate Agreement, and that takes place in November in Egypt. Finance 
for countries in the global south remains really a very contentious issue, remains a real sticking point. The other thing that will be contentious and talked about is what is referred to as loss and damage. The U.S. remains opposed to the idea of a separate pot of money for the losses and damages that uh, really vulnerable countries keep seeing uh, as a result of a warming climate. So parts of their territory being wiped out, um, agricultural yields being affected, uh, extreme heat having all kinds of health impacts. Countries, these very vulnerable countries are making the case at the international climate talks that, hey, we didn't put any of these emissions into the atmosphere. The rich industrialized world did. Therefore, we are owed money to repair these damages. So this bill, this big deal climate bill, of course, does not address that either. So, you know, that's likely to be leveraged by a lot of countries at the next climate talks, including by China. So I would not be surprised to hear countries hold the U.S. to account uh, on money. And speaking of uh, China, in response to House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visiting Taiwan, China has cut off climate discussions with the U.S. The U.S. is, as you've noted, the largest historic emitter. China is the largest current emitter. So what does this mean now that climate is part of this um, rising tensions with China in light of this recent bill? We are at a time when the two countries that uh, – need to do the most to address a big global issue like climate change. Those two countries are the United States and China. And we are at an era of um, really historic tension between those two countries. So this was the latest iteration of that. Uh, it does not affect China's own climate targets in any way. It does not affect China's participation in international climate talks. It refers to uh, bilateral talks. There weren't big deal bilateral talks scheduled that are going to, you know, not take place as a result of this announcement. But, you know, it's reflective of the diplomatic tension between these two, these two countries. The path toward the Paris Climate Agreement really started with when Xi Jinping and Barack Obama sat down and had this bilateral deal that set the table for Paris. A lot of that, what happened there came down to kind of personal relationships and peer pressure among heads of state. Uh, what does this do now that the U.S. finally has its first ever comprehensive domestic climate law? What does that do to the hand of Joe Biden, uh, John Kerry, both veterans on the international stage who pride themselves on their knowledge of international relations? What does it do at that kind of top level of the pyramid personally? It allows the United States, starting with the president and his special envoy, to say, we are at the table. Uh, it is a very different position from one that you saw a, a few years ago with the U.S. pulling out of the Paris Climate Agreement when Joe Biden was elected. One of the first things he did was to rejoin one of the, the early things he did in his administration was to make these pledges to reduce the U.S. emissions. And this is the necessary next step to say, you see, we've now invested, we've now agreed to invest a lot of money, $370 billion towards that goal. Now, there's a broader debate here. Does addressing global climate change require these two rival powers, the United States and China, to cooperate and be really nice to each other? Or could you get the same result, which is a rapid decarbonizing of these two big economies uh, with these two countries competing with each other to be the gr global green leader, if you will? So look, I mean, you know, that we will just have to wait and see. It should be noted that China, while being by far the world's uh, leader in burning coal. China consumes more coal than any other country by far. It has also uh, really stepped up its investments in renewable energy, right? So it's also the biggest 
solar producer, and it's also the biggest wind producer, and it churns out a lot of electric vehicles. So that needs to be kept in in mind when we're talking about the U.S.-China relationship. What is China doing for its own economic self-interest? Yeah, it's going green partly for its yeah for its own economic competitiveness and its own own reasons. Another country that's going forward, Australia, is also working on a significant climate bill that is estimated to reduce the emissions to about forty three percent compared to two thousand five levels. Kind of on the same similar path to the U.S. So, uh, meanwhile, in the U.K., uh, Boris Johnson is leaving despite all his issues. He's been fairly strong on climate. It's not clear if his successors will be as strong as he has. On climate. So, what are these other pieces, countries going forward, maybe others going backwards? How does this all fit together? Yeah, it's a really interesting moment. Uh, I think you've pointed to two um, super important countries. Australia is a big emitter. Um, The United Kingdom, of course, you know, uh, led the Industrial Revolution uh, by burning coal. So, where these countries go in the next eight years? is super important. Now, Australia, like the United States, is one of those few countries where climate action is politically really polarizing. Under the previous government, there was um, a lot of resistance to um, taking climate action. This new government that has taken over has now said that it plans to reduce by at least 43% its emissions by 2030 and go to net zero by 2050. It's a big deal for Australia, but it's also pretty late. This target um, is far short of the United Kingdom's target. It's far short of what the EU has pledged. But As I said, it is a big turn for Australia. Britain, by contrast, for the last, I don't know, like 10, 15 years, climate hasn't really been a very politically polarizing issue. Conservative politicians and labor politicians, you know, haven't fought that much over climate in a way that we are familiar with in the United States or like Australia. And the UK, it must be said, has a very ambitious climate target that's been already enshrined in law. The UK has pledged to reduce its emissions by 68% during this decade, um, and then another, uh, uh, and by 78% by 2035. That is by far the most ambitious goal among major industrial countries in in the world, as far as I can see. Uh, However, it doesn't have a very detailed plan to reach those targets. And that's the challenge before the next conservative leader. Right. And that's a big deal. Policy durability, it seems to me. That's one area where uh, President Biden's in a stronger position. You know, Barack Obama never, never got a climate law through Congress. So there's always this question of whether U.S. policy will zig and zag as Australia has with the next election. But now that, that this is enshrined in law, a, a single party law um, in the U.S., it seems like it does give more certainty to the U.S. Even if there's a Republican t- president in 24, this law is still going to be in place. So it sounds like this law is going to buy down the, the price of technology. It's not going to address the flow of financial resources and support and pledges to developing countries that the U.S. has made and the developing countries are expecting. Uh, there's some forward and backwards in, with the U.K., and Australia. I uh, want to close by you know, coming to Europe because Europe is in this big uh, disruptive moment when it comes to energy because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, there's been some talk about you know, how can the U.S. help Europe? Does this law indirectly or directly do anything to help Europe get off Russian oil and gas? European lawmakers are faced with a choice. Will they use Russia's war in Ukraine to rapidly get off of gas and oil um, by extension? Or will it just prolong the continent's reliance on gas, but just try to get gas from elsewhere? That's the real challenge before the European Union. Um, I, I, I do think that the US climate law can help Europe make the case that they have a major partner in the United States 
in decarbonizing its economy. It remains to be seen whether the United States and the European Union might talk about, might cooperate on something like a carbon border tax, which would allow it to really use a carbon border tax as leverage against China. The U.S. climate law certainly allows the United States and the European Union to stand shoulder to shoulder at the next climate talks and use that kind of diplomatic leverage uh, against China principally. And I think it has some real impact in, again, bringing down global costs of renewable energy when the, you know, when both the European Union and the United States is pumping in so much money, uh, that will undoubtedly have some impact that will move the needle downwards on the cost of renewable technology. As you know, going into the Conference of Parties, the annual climate summit, a lot of what people focus on is, is momentum. And uh, going into the COP27 in Egypt later this year, how does this U.S. law add to the dynamic and the momentum going into that critical meeting? I think even more important than what impact this law might have is the question of what impact will the reality of climate change have, you know, on on the talks, um, because we've seen these extreme weather events, including especially in the rich world, uh, really just clobbering Europe with these extreme high temperatures, as well as the United States. You've seen the fires in the American West, the the drought both in Europe and the United States, and you know, of course, many in the global south would say, yeah, it's hitting you a little faster than perhaps you expected, but we've been talking about these kinds of debilitating impacts of global warming for many years. So I guess I'm I'm curious whether the reality of climate change will drive momentum at the next climate talks. Sumini, thank you so much for sharing your insights on this pivotal moment in climate. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. On this Climate One, we've been talking about the good, the bad, and the ugly of the Inflation Reduction Act. Climate One's empowering conversations connect all aspects of the climate emergency. To hear more, subscribe to our podcast on Apple or wherever you get your pods. Talking about climate can be hard, often depressing, difficult, sometimes really exciting and interesting. And it's critical to address the transitions we need to make in all parts of society. Please help us get people talking more about climate by giving us a rating or review if you're listening on Apple. You can do that right now on your device. You can also help by sending a link to this episode to a friend. We've got lots of good climate news to talk about now. By sharing, you can help people have their own deeper climate conversations. Brad Marshland is our senior producer. Our managing director is Jenny Park. Our producers and audio editors are Ariana Brocious and Austin Cologne. Megan Basilia is our production manager. Our team also includes consulting producer Sarah Catherine Coxon. Our theme music was composed by George Young and arranged by Matt Wilcox. Gloria Duffy is CEO of the Commonwealth Club of California, the nonprofit and nonpartisan forum where our program originates. I'm Greg Dalton.